de présenter ma, ma collègue Jennifer Yee, de, qui enseigne ici à Oxford, qui est fellow de, 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 de Christchurch. Euh, C'est pas fellow, vous êtes si. student. Si ah, ouais, D'accord, un peu, un peu, un peu, un peu, ça ira, d'accord. Euh, ils sont un peu, un peu particuliers à Christchurch. Euh, mais euh, Jennifer, donc, euh, euh, ancienne Proust ici, je, 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 je tiens à indiquer qu'il y a une longue tradition de d'érudition proustienne euh, ici, euh, avec Jean-Yves Tadier qui, qui, a, qui a été professeur ici, avec, euh, avec euh, notre regretté euh, Malcolm Bowie qui a, qui a terminé son grand livre sur Proust lorsqu'il était euh, euh, professeur euh, à, à Oxford, euh, Jean Cézenec Chez, euh, dans le passé, etc. Donc, euh, et nous avons une, la bibliothèque, une bibliothèque particulièrement euh, remarquable à Oxford sur... Euh, pour, pour les études proustiennes, et nous avons des, des thèses comme par exemple celle de Jennifer et Adam, par exemple. Ils sont tous, on est très, très fiers de, de, de cette, 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 ce lien avec Proust que nous avons à, à, à Oxford et avec Ruskin d'ailleurs. Ça, c'est une autre. <rire> euh, donc, je reviens à Jennifer, excusez-moi. Euh, donc, euh, elle enseigne Proust, elle est plutôt 19e euh, elle a écrit un livre qui s'appelle « Exotic Subversions in 19th Century French Fiction euh, » et euh, elle a contribué au, au dictionnaire de romantisme euh, d'Alain Vaillant euh, et puis des travaux sur le ré, réalisme et le naturalisme autour de la question de la, du colonialisme. Euh, elle est d'ailleurs en train d'écrire de, de, un, un livre qui s'appelle « The Colonial » Comedy Imperialism in the French Realist Novel, qui va être publié par uh, Oxford University Press. Elle a changé un tout petit peu de titre, donc uh, ce sera uh, Proust and the Anti-Travel Narrative. The virtual might come in at the end. If oui, we have avant c'était un virtual <laughs> travel, donc, donc anti-travel et virtual travel. I'm, uh, apologies to those who would have preferred me speaking in French. There was some hesitation, which I think is why I, I was between the English speakers and the French speakers. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate in this table ronde. So I'm very intimidated not only in succeeding to this grand tradition of Oxford Proustian study, but also being um, uh, invited to speak with some real Proustians. I am, of course, as Nikki said, a 19e Easter. And although I hold that the 19th century ended in 1922, I do realize that this is a minority view. So I'm, as, I, as Nikki said, I'm talking about Proust and the anti-travel narrative today. And if you're interested in why I avoided the word virtual, we can talk about that maybe over lunch. So the 19th century, as you all know, saw a new vibrancy in the genre of travel writing. And because of the importance of romantic irony, this spurs in turn what I'm calling the anti-travel narrative. And my argument today is that in A La Recherche, Proust is responding to the different variants of this anti-travel narrative that he knew very well from his 19th century precursors, and that he uses these variants as stepping stones to something far beyond them. So the 19th century anti-travel narrative can be broken down into two main stages initially. So first of all, the imagination. The destination that you're going to travel to is imagined. And the second stage is disillusionment. The traveler is disappointed when confronted with the real. And this disillusionment sometimes appears as an, in narrative form, as a full narrative, and sometimes it's just a topos or a metaphor that's referred to briefly, a motif. And there is often, but not always, a third stage to this dialectical movement, and the third stage is, of course, memory. The experience of the real is renewed retrospectively. Or this could be transcendence. The disappointment of the real is transcendent through art. And you can already see that I'm not getting that far away from Proust, even if I'm still stuck in the mid-19th century. So 19th century literature revisits these stages, these three stages, again and again, and there are differing approaches to this. So I'm going to discuss these variants using terms that are quite simplistic, such as romantic, realist, and symbolist. But I'm not suggesting that these anti-travel narratives are limited to a particular period. They reappear um, in various forms. Nor are they the invention of the 19th century. I think they become particularly important then, but they're certainly around before. André Guillot has described the 19th century as a long pr processus de désitinérance, de désintoxication du voyage, a sort of leeching out of the excitement of travel. And so Proust revisits this 19th century tradition of disenchantment, 
and he re-enchants the encounter with the real. And I think in that um, argument, I'm very close to a lot of what Natalie was just saying about the re-encounter, re re-enchanting re the encounter with the real. So the first variant I'm going to talk about is the romantic realist anti-travel nar narrative, romantic slash realist, but they are actually unsurprisingly similar. The romantic approach contrasts the real with the imagined, finds the real wanting, and dwells on the lost charms of the imagination. And this is, is famously described by Nerval when he talks about travelling in the real Orient as a loss of the space of dreams. J'ai déjà perdu royaume après royaume et province à province, la plus belle moitié de l'univers, et bientôt je ne vais plus savoir où réfugier mes rêves. And so that's the romantic version. The realist anti-travel narrative, which I'm putting in the same category, is extremely similar in structural terms at least. So in this version, the real and the imagined are contrasted again, and they're found to be incompatible again, and this is part of a painful learning process. Uh, the, the realist anti-travel narrative involves a focalizer who suffers from an overactive and badly guided imagination, an excess of what Jules de Gauthier pleasingly termed bovarisme, and bovarisme, of course, is the human capacity to imagine that one is something that one is not. So this is, of course, the story that we know from Cervantes, and it's the story told by Flaubert. It's also true of Daudet's Tartarin de Tarascon. Tartarin is a kind of male southern Emma. This realist approach <coughs> differs from the romantic approach. Structurally, they're the same, but um, the realist approach dwells on the disappointing experience of the real, while the romantic approach valorizes the imagination. And I'm hoping you're recognizing all this in Proust even before I, I point that out. So the, the second structure is the romantic slash nostalgic anti-travel narrative which is often a topos rather than a narrative. It's structured a bit differently from the first because it combines phase three, the phase of memory, with phase one or the imagination. And here, the desire to discover new places is understood as a longing to return to a place that one already knew in the past, usually in childhood, but sometimes in an earlier incarnation. So this place is necessarily lost. And therefore, of course, we have the second phase, which is the phase of disillusionment, because you can't actually go back to childhood in this narrative. The point of the exercise is to dwell on the desire to return to the past. And many of the authors Proust was particularly um, uh, enamored of, that he was particularly influenced by, used this uh, at least as a topos, if not as a narrative. So Baudelaire speaks of the nostalgie du pays qu'on ignore. Pierre Lotti, who Proust loved as a young man at least, uses the term ressouvenir. Gautier sees in the mysterious attraction one feels for a place one has never been to, d'obscure souvenirs de race, and recalls Plato's theories of memory of experiences that we've had before birth. So in this nostalgic romantic anti-travel narrative, the exotic space <coughs> is invested with the intimate identity of the self and every object speaks the soul's douce langue natale, invoking uh, idealized childhood memories, the vers paradis des amours enfantines. The third anti-travel narrative that I'll refer to, and the last one, I'll reassure you, the last one before we move back to, to Proust properly. The third one is the symbolist anti-travel narrative. So the last decades of the 19th century, the chronological 19th century, not the long one I was referring to, the last decades inherit via Baudelaire the romantic tradition in which the dreamer is mournfully conscious of the superiority of the imagined voyage over the real voyage. And the classic embodiment of this stance is Huysman's A Rebours, the chapter in which Des Essences sets out on a voyage to London but gets no further than English pub on the Rue de Rivoli. So this symbolist anti-travel narrative neatly preempts the second stage, that's the stage of disappointment. It sidesteps the confrontation with empirical reality. And this stance is already taken by Baudelaire in his prose poems, Les Projets, where he asks, Pourquoi contraindre mon corps de à changer de place puisque mon âme voyage si lestement? And in Le Port, where he watches immobile the movements of those who still have the strength of will to travel. So where does Proust come into all this? It should be fairly obvious, but of course he comes in in very differing ways in relation to each of these narratives. So in his youth, Proust is of course attracted to the symbolist stance, the one that preempts the phase of disappointment. And in 1892, he contrasts Baudelaire with a new generation um, Actually, in this 1892 um, book review, he seems to be taking an anti-symbolist stance, but I think he's taking a symbolist stance in, in, in deep down underneath. So the new generation has reclaimed la réalité morale du voyage. That is, travel becomes a mean to achieve moral improvement through the assertion of the will. And this sounds like praise, but in his book review, Proust keeps quoting Le Voyage, Baudelaire's Le Voyage, so that he seems to be mourning the replacement of Baudelaire's disappointed travelers, the ones who thought there was no point traveling because it's all the same everywhere. 
by this new energetic travel, um, generation of travellers who do have this moralité réelle du voyage. And then in Jean Santeuil, the narrator asks, Pourquoi voyagez-vous si souvent? Les carrosses de voiture vous emmènent bien lentement ou votre rêve vous conduirait si vite? Pour être au bord de la mer, vous n'avez qu'à fermer les yeux. Which is a very close echo of Baudelaire's own stance. What's the point of travelling? By the time he's writing à la recherche, however, Proust moves beyond this symbolist reje rejection of the real. But what he does is incorporate it rather than dismiss it. And I think it's because he incorporates the symbolist discourse that many critics, not least Malcolm Bowie, have seen à la recherche as taking the symbolist stance, at least to some extent. So in that sense, the imagination is superior, so why bother travelling? Bowie opens his major study on Proust by seeing Proust's narrator or character, and he doesn't distinguish them at that point, as an imaginist, and he borrows the term from Jane Austen. An imaginist is a person who spends too much time in fantasy and flight from the real. Austen's realist sense, he says, shows her characters undergoing a learning process through which they come to reject their imaginative excesses. And Bowie claims that Proust's narrator is, unlike Austen's characters, an untreatable case, whose power of fantasy <laughs> is still essentially a strength. So we have the symbolist Proust. However, Proust's criticism of symbolism, as studied by Marion Schmidt, is explicit as early as his article Contre l'Obscurité of 1896. And in some ways, La Recherche seemed closer to the, the realist pattern that I was talking about, which emphasizes the learning process in which one comes to reject or disqualify earlier illusions. In the opening pages of the novel, uh, we are made to understand how useless it is to hope to meet in the real world a woman glimpsed just in a wet dream, comme ceux qui partent en voyage pour voir de leurs yeux une cité désirée et s'imaginent qu'on peut goûter dans une réalité le charme du songe. We're warned from the outset that this is a mistake. And later, in the same sort of terms, we mistake our emotional investment in an imagined place for the reality of the place itself. And that's one of the illusions of l'âge des noms, when nous partons chercher dans une cité une âme qu'elle ne peut contenir a very similar expression. So à la recherche shares many of the traits of the realist narrative of disillusionment, which emphasizes the learning curve of the protagonist rather than delights of the delights of the illusions, which would be the romantic emphasis. So this learning process undergone by Proust's narrator is often seen as a neat three-part process. Um, and these three parts correspond to the three phases of the anti-travel narrative as I set them out initially. The first phase is the age, uh, age of illusion, sorry, which corresponds to the age des noms. It's followed by the confrontation with the real, the disappointment, and then Proust goes on to the third phase of the dialectics, transcendence of the real through art and memory. So what we'd have, in, according to that reading, is a sort of super <coughs> symbolist narrative. It doesn't preempt confrontation with the real, but it goes beyond it, in, um, beyond the symbolist version. This antagonistic pairing of the dream voyage and the real is foregrounded by um, the section headings non de pays le non and non de pays le pays. And this antithetical relationship was initially supposed to have a much more structuring um, purpose, an important structuring role in the novel. Uh, but now it's split over the two volumes. Um, this, uh, these, the two possible endings are discussed by a certain Anne Simon and following her Pierre-Louis Ray, um, who emphasized that this phase of disillusionment in Non de Pays, Le Pays, is only a temporary ending. So at the very end of the whole novel, in Le Temps Retrouvé, we move on to a third phase, which is transcendence. And, and Simon contrasts this Proustian third mm. stage with Merval's ending, the ending of disillusionment. So Marcel's return to the Bois de Boulogne at the end of Non de Pays, Le Non, corresponds with the disillusionment of the narrator at the end of Merval's Sylvie. And the Bois de Boulogne episode is thus what Simon calls a fin nervalienne, um, but the end of Le Temps Retrouvé offers us a very different fin Proustienne. Uh, Proust's own essay on Nerval sees naivety or madness in the belief that the real might live up to expectations. Nerval is, a sort of, is very far from the, symbolist, the cynicism of the symbolists. The real voyage back to the geographically real land known in childhood can only disappoint us. And in contrast to this story of a misguided voyage, what Proust offers us is a third stage in which the lost land is revisited through memory and artistic creation. So we have the failed attempt in Sylvie to locate the, real, the lost land in real geographical space, whereas the narrator of Le Temps Retrouvé, in his wisdom, knows that les pays n'étaient pas tels que leur nom me les peignait. And he knows that you can't go back to find the um, images of memory. Le voyage ne faisait que me proposer une fois de plus l'illusion que ces impressions anciennes existaient hors de moi. He knows that it's an illusion. 
So this all seems to suggest that Proust is offering us a positive variant of the symbolist rejection of voyage, a sort of dialectical overcoming of disillusionment. And a lot of the theoretical pronouncements of Le Temps Retrouvé do seem to hark back to the symbolist stance. This reading corresponds to what I sometimes think of as the neat reading of La Recherche, as fitting into three stages, illusion, disillusionment and transcendence. And this neat reading concludes with the superiority of art to the real in a super symbolist position. The real is effectively disqualified, though not entirely preempted. But I don't believe that Proust's treatment of travel can be reduced to this anti-realism. And I, um, since I'm setting myself up against uh, Barton, Deleuze and possibly Malcolm Bowie in saying this, I wish to point out that once again I'm in excellent company because I am following the work of a certain Anne Simon once again <laughs> um, in this argument um, for her ph phenomenological approach, which is probably less pragmatic than the one I'm taking more thematically to travel writing. So Simon argues that the tendency, she argues against the tendency to read Proust as le modèle par excellence de l'autotélisme littéraire and Le Temps Retrouvé in particular as an affirmation of the caractère purement mental de la réalité. So of course there's no such thing in Proust's world as a direct unmediated reality. Reality cannot be perceived in a purely material or sensory way with no reference to imagination, art, memory or interpretation. But literary creation depends on the experience of reality, so you have to live the truth in the material present and thanks to the material present. So Proust's narrative of travel as a consequence is neither a straightforward realist story of disillusionment nor a symbolist avoidance of the real. He shows us that travel can only be truly experienced when it is interiorized, but he also reminds us of the existence of the real outside ourselves. So one of my first questions then is, was Proust a realist? And the answer is that he was, partly, I suppose. So the initial phase of illusion is most developed in the protagonist's youthful daydreaming on place names. And we have the names of real and invented places in northern France and Italy, which give rise to a two-pronged series of fantasies. This has been much studied since uh, Barthes' famous essay Proust et les noms. Barthes claims that for Proust, le nom propre est en quelque sorte la forme linguistique de la réminiscence. <coughs> Um, I disagree with that, of course, entirely, because the daydreams inspired by proper nouns are not part of reminiscence, the third phase, but part of the first phase, that of the imagination. And more strikingly, the passages where Proust dwells on the non propre uh, make use of some typically realist narrative tactics. And in particular, the illusions are carefully linked <coughs> to their sources. And something, this is a phenomenon that's called source tagging or source monitoring in some recent approaches inspired by theory of mind. It's not a new phenomenon to link um, these dreamings to their sources, but that's a, a new way of talking about it. Proust's careful source tagging of illusions has a comic effect in general. So the young Marcel's heart palpitates as he reads advertisements from the railway networks and he personifies as handsome and generous the 122 train that he later thinks of as un voyageur artiste et blond. So the stage of the imagination is undercut by being source tagged to its banal origin in the train timetable and train ads. And these dreams of distant places arise from an external source. They're also tagged as belonging to a younger self. And this earlier self is the self that is involved with the symbolist anti-travel narrative. In this version, the voyage is preempted, not as in Huysmans' case by a cynical rejection of the real, but on his doctor's orders. He can't go on the trip because the, he, um, he's too ill. So although the power of names eut pour conséquence en accroissant les joies arbitraires de mon imagination d'aggraver la déception future de mes vo voyages, illusion is tagged to the younger self by the use of the imperfect. Je n'étais curieux, je n'étais avide de connaître ce que ce que je croyais plus vrai que moi-même got the imperfect that reminds us this is always the young self. And similarly, in the famous passage on reading in the garden at Combray, he notes, J'ai eu à cause du livre que je lisais alors la nostalgie d'un pays montueux et fluviatile. So here the point is the source tagging to the younger self. It's not the vision itself. What he's getting at, what we're being told, is that he was wrong. So here we have the double perspective of the mature narrator and the young protagonist. And in addition, the phase of illusions is always presented as a response to a source. And this is, of course, exactly what happens in the case of Tartarin de Tarascon and Emma Bovary. The phase of illusions has a source, an implicit source. So dreams of Baalbek combine the, the imagery of wild nature and seascapes associated with Brittany with the Gothic art of Normandy. 
and each of these two sides has a separate source. It is Le Grandin who initially supplies the young protagonist with dreams of tempests and Nordic climes. Le Grandin's descriptions are given in direct speech, which allows Proust to exploit his brilliant flair for pastiche. And what he exposes, um, I think, uh, is pretentiously literary language. And I had thought of it as symbolist language, but Natalie has called it romantic, so I, we might uh, wonder about, I'll question that afterwards, whether it's romantic language or symbolist language that's been pastiched. Marion Schmidt points out that Le Grandin's style recherché reflects that of several writers of the fin de siècle, among them the younger Proust himself in Les Plaisirs et les Jours. In any case, the dream voyage to Baalbek is source tagged, firstly to a younger self, and then to a specific character, Le Grandin, whose judgment we have good reason to mistrust. And of course, as we know in the quote that Natalie just gave, when he was pushed to introduce Marcel and his grandmother to his sister, Le Grandin labels his own word pictures as fictive. Ce pays sans vérité, ce pays de pure fiction. Mm. So he, he himself is acknowledging um, that it's a doubtful source. The other aspect that's taken on by the imagined Baalbek is the Gothic, and it, of course, has its source in Swan. Swan's descriptions are also given in direct discourse, uh, so again, a pastiche, and they use the neutral langu language of a guidebook. Um, these descriptions give a misleading sense that we can account for the real in an objective way. So what Proust is doing is pastiching both the aesthetic symbolist position in Le Grandin and the pseudo-objective stance in um, Swan. In this way, the imagined Baalbek is source-tagged very precisely in other people's discourse. And this is, of course, a move reminiscent of Flaubert's citationary practice and of a certain kind of realism. So was Proust a realist? He carefully source tags these voyages, the dream voyages, to specific discourses, and he does look at the realist confrontation with the real and disillusionment as a necessary part of the process by which the protagonist becomes an author. In Peter Brook's words, Proust's novel is a transformative of the realist tradition. That is to say, it includes it and moves beyond it. The Proustian real, however, is not to be taken in a naive sense. First of all, the direct, raw experience of the real is inherently disappointing, as Natalie has mentioned as well. The, when we experience travel in the immediate moment, it is marred by contingent detail. So when we first go to see the sculpture of the Virgin on the facade of the Baalbek church, the narrator is disappointed. First of all, because the church turns out to be far from the sea, which means that the maritime imagination and the Gothic imagination are split. But the other problem is that the real statue lacks the aesthetic impact that it has in photos, because unlike in photos, in the real world, one sees it in rivalry with une affiche électorale et la pointe de ma canne. And the Virgin cannot escape les regards du café et du bureau d'omnibus. In a word, she is soumise à la tyrannie du particulier. By opening up the mysterious name Balbec, the visitor has broken its power of evocation and through this breach rush in other images, un tramway, un café, les gens qui passaient sur la place, and they all come to set themselves alongside the church, which mars the vision that one can have of it. So the photographs of the Balbec Virgin remove the troublesome contingent reality that surrounds the real statue. But it would be folly to reduce the experience of travel to the idea that one might have of an unknown destination based on a mere photograph. And this idea is aussi stupide que ceux qui n'espèrent plus éprouver de surprise devant sa marque de Venise parce que la photographie leur a appris la forme de ces dômes. So photography seems to be offering us a way to get rid of all this messy reality, but actually that's a stupid idea. Photography is not, not giving us the real. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the Baalbek church, one source for the phase of illusion an implicit source, not an explicit source, is Ruskin. Ruskin is also the source for images of Venice and other of the great travel motifs. But once again, his presence is not explicit in the final version. It is in Esquisse 15, however, that the source tagging is much more explicit. In this version, Maman reads the relevant passages of Stones of Venice aloud in the train on the way to Venice. And the point of this is that is the disjunction between the imagined Venice produced by Ruskin's words and the real Venice that we immediately encounter. So we have that pattern of illusion, disillusionment. Seeing Venice through Ruskin's eyes is the fulfillment of a long cherished artistic pilgrimage. But Proust was increasingly ambivalent about Ruskin in the years immediately preceding the Contre Sainte Beuve project. And I think the removing Ruskin from that um, original project in the Esquisse is part of that ambivalence. So Bloch mocks Ruskinian tourism, um, the, the pose of Ruskinian-style tourists in Venice. 
Oui, naturellement, pouvoir des sorbets avec des belles madames, tout en faisant semblant de lire les Stones of Venice de Lord John Ruskin, sombre raseur et l'un des plus barbifiants bons hommes qui soit. These are Bloch's words, naturally. Of course, Bloch is discredited by his errors in English pronunciation and the title that he um, gives uh, Ruskin. But what, we do, what happens here is once again an explicit source tagging that leads us to doubt even Ruskin as a perceptive screen, a valid perspe perceptive screen for understanding Venice. So we have a problem here. The experience of the real is disappointing because it's subject to the particulier, the tyranny du particulier, or random contingent detail. And to rise above this tyranny du particulier, we seek a mediation from organizing frameworks such as Ruskin or guidebooks. But these guides supply us with misleading, simplifying ideas, in the same way that photography falsifies the real by simplifying it and interpreting it for us. So yes, Proust was a realist, but we're having trouble getting at the real. It's quite hard to have access to it. So my little next little guiding subheading is the shock of the real, which of course is where the real does um, engage, we do engage with the real. So if we're moving from the ideal of the phase of dreams to the particulier of the real, we are necessarily going to be disappointed. And to get beyond disappointment, we have to reach a third phase, which is the vrai. But this third phase is not a simple symbolist rejection of the real. The Proustian vrai, on the other hand, unlike the symbolists, actually incorporates the contingent detail of the particulier. A symbolist, of course, would um, confirm Pierre, Pierre Bayard's claim in Comment parler des lieux où on n'a pas été. Um, and I think this claim is only partly ironic. His claim is that travel would be better if you didn't actually do it. Um, and I don't think, I think the symbolist would agree with that, but Proust would not. Proust shows that contact with the real is in fact supremely energizing. It's capable of contradicting the imagination and it can offer us something better and more vivid. So rejection of travel into the real world That rejection, that symbolist rejection, is embodied in none other than Tante Léonie, whose horizons have progressively shrunk to just the village, then her house, then her room, and finally her bed. And although she likes gazing outside into the world in the street, um, it is shocked, her gaze on the outside world is shocked by any infraction of habit. So Tante Léonie is a female provincial désessante, who represents a negative role model for the young Marcel, <laughs> as I think désessante does. On the contrary, we may gain a partial victory over time, at least sometimes, by moving in space. Il y a des cas assez rares, il est vrai, où la sédentarité immobilisant les jours, le meilleur moyen de gagner du temps, c'est de changer de place. So the experience of the real through an actual voyage is not merely a disappointment. It's something more traumatic and more life-giving, a shock. And Georges Poulet argues that the Proustian voyage is in some ways more marvelous than memory itself for it brings together places that belong to different planes of existence. It breaks a law and disturbs the appearance of things, abolishing the distance that keeps things neatly separate. For Proust, even without a flying carpet, travel is thus a magical or supernatural action, and travel should allow us to feel as deeply as possible la différence entre le départ et l'arrivée, de la ressentir dans sa totalité intacte. And one can experience this difference as acutely in the real voyage as one does in the imagination. So the experience of travel in the real world is a salutary shock. It puts the individual subject in contact with something that cannot be reduced to itself. And here we come back to the relationship between the general and the particular. And Bloch, when he takes Mar Marcel to Brussels, has given him a, a wonderful experience. And that experience is uh, the one thing that is not simply a summary of earlier female beauties. And that thing he talks about as le présent. And I think it has both meanings of the word. Le présent vraiment divin, le seul que nous ne puissions recevoir de nous-mêmes, devant lequel expirent toutes les créations logiques de notre intelligence et que nous ne pouvons demander qu'à la réalité, un charme individuel. So the experience of the individual, of individuality, is here called the présent, that is the gift represented, represented by the irreducible individuality of the present moment. This charme individuel is a positive variant of the tyranny du particulier. And it cannot be provided by the self for the self. It's only by confronting ourselves with the real, that is the external world, that we can have this experience of the irreducibly individual phenomenon. At first sight, this appears to contradict the, that other Proustian wisdom, namely that it's only the work of a great artist that one can find a truly individual vision. 
Ooh, I have to not have to. I don't want to skip Venice. Um, but of course, the individual view of the artist is um, an individual view, comme si l'individuel existait. So we get a sense of the contingent real, the hesitant approach to the contingent real when Proust compares travelling by car to travelling by train. If you travel by train, you go from one na place name to another, so it's a kind of idealist version of travel. But travelling by car is, um, uh, gives us that sense of contingent reality because we circle in on the aim of the travel. Okay. Real travel is a shock that breaks with the rules of habit, so it's sometimes used as a metaphor for the movement from one self to another. And that metaphorical voyage takes us from the self in love to the self that is indifferent. And these are given in two dreams by Swan, uh, one before he, he finishes loving Odette and one after. Um, in the first one, he undertakes, he dreams that he goes to the, on the, ho the trip to Holland that he's been putting off because he's in love with Odette. And in his dream, leaning out of the train window, he leans out vers un jeune homme qui sur le quai lui disait adieu en pleurant. Sw Swan cherchait à le convaincre de partir avec lui. The young man in tears is his current self in love with Odette, and the dream shows Swan his future self, who no longer suffers because of her. After his love for Odette fades, Swan has another dream, and this time he's walking on a hilly path where walkers disappear from sight when they go downhill. When he sees Odette slipping out of sight, uh, an unknown young man wearing a fez is weeping, and um, so the woman slipping out of sight is obviously the um, movement from one self to another, and the present self tries to comfort the young man by wiping his eyes. So here, the movement of travel is a metaphor um, for the movement from oneself to the next. I'll speak rather briefly about the real voyage to Venice, which itself takes on the qualities of the metaphorical voyage where one self is left behind. The younger self, the self in love with Albertine, is left behind, and we move on to the self indifferent to Albertine. The voyage to Venice is placed in the penultimate position of Albertine disparu, so it stands as a promise for the adoration perpetuelle scene, which itself is in the penultimate position in the last volume. And Venice marks a marked shift away from the anti-travel narrative. It corresponds to the movement from one self to another, so it's a good thing, and it also acts as proleptic, it foreshadows the final epiphanies. So what we have is a rewriting of the romantic anti-travel narrative, specifically the romantic nostalgic one with the idea of ressouvenir, in which the voyage is a, a longed for, the voyage is a voyage back into the past. In Cambrai, we already learned that the voyage of discovery was a voyage of return. And of course, the epiphanies of Le Temps Retrouvé give us the same thing. Um, les vrais paradis sont des paradis qu'on a perdus. So we have a sense that the, this is this return to a childhood paradise. But of course, in Proust's lost paradise, the lost paradise is not irretrievably lost. And what we have in Venice is a rather different return because it combines the voyage out into the real world with the voyage back into the past. The um, miraculous return to childhood is prefigured by the younger adult's experience of Venice itself. Uh, so what we have is a systematic use of an esthétique de la surimpression. Mm. Combray is reborn in Venice, which means that what we rediscover is the lost moi Combray, or the self of childhood. So the past is not only accessible through involuntary memory, but through the meeting of past and present space in uh, the geographically distant Venice. Uh, and of course, the real voyage to Combray, to the real Combray, is not effective. It is in Venice that one finds Combray. That's the first miracle performed by the Venetian Travel Institute. The second miracle is the transformation of everyday contingent reality into the eternal present of art. And here we have again the aesthetics of superimposition. Everyday objects are combined by being transformed into art, marble, and gold. So the real travel becomes a form of transcendence. How do we escape from the double bind that we saw in the case of Balbec? The double bind being false conceptualization on one hand or contingent detail on the other. In Venice, what happens is that we're not neglecting or rejecting the humble particularité of individual experience. The experience of voyage can actually incorporate these. So the window of the Venice Hotel seems to fall into the trap of illusions because it's source tagged. Um, it's reproduced dans tous les musées de moulage et dans tous les livres d'art illustrés. But the significance of the window transcends misleading generalizations and contingent particularity because it's a perfect meeting of art and individual love and it's transformed by the presence behind it of Maman with her infinite um, tenderness. So the medieval window actually is a conjunction of aesthetic form, individual contingency and personal significance. So this is a transformation of the anti-travel narrative of the 19th century. We have a pro-travel narrative. 
And Venice is a wonderful metaphor for um, a miraculous transfer of, meeting, of meaning. Sorry. In fact, it's a metaphor for metaphor itself, because it's a point where sea and earth meet. And this, is, to some extent, is true of Balbec, but mainly Balbec as seen through Elstir's paintings. I have, was going to have a very brief conclusion where I did bring in the word virtual. I don't know if I have time for a couple of minutes on that. Yeah, just yep. OK. So um, what I was going to talk about and decided not to is the um, virtual experience of the voyage as we produced by Proust's prose, the long and sinuous sentences of Proust's prose. And I was going to compare that to the mansillant tracé by the gondola that going through the... Um, uh, through Venice and through canals of Venice. But I want to argue just briefly that the sheer difficulty of reading Proust is essential because it's only through the difficulty of reading Proust that we have a hope of grasping the individual experience of the actual voyage. Um, Bowie put this very wittily, the reader who does not hesitate is lost and he emphasizes the performative power of Proust's writing. So Proust, I think, actually is very hesitant about language. And again, maybe we might disagree slightly with Natalie here. Um, I think that he's very wary of banal everyday language, which can only capture generalized experience. It falsifies the shock of the real. He talks about cette espèce de déchet de l'expérience à peu près identique pour chacun, um, that we, th it doesn't, not going to give us um, an adequate version. And the déchet of reality is like the common noun that offers us une petite image claire et usuelle of things the ton conventionnel, so these idea of conventional images, the déchet, image claire et usuelle, are actually falsifying our experience of the real. Our, of the present, our experience of the present moment is hampered by contingent detail. We can only know the real retrospectively, but language simplifies that and falsifies it. So what we've got is a trap. And how do we actually get at our experience of the real? And the, the Proustian answer is, of course, that what we need is language that accounts for the real, getting rid of the contingent reality, but it has to be complicated, difficult language, because what we have to avoid at all costs is giving the impression that everybody knows what we mean, which is what simple language does. And he sums this up um, in his article on Nerval, when he compares Nerval's approach to writing about travel to Racine's. Racine gives us the word Turquie, but that's it. He says, that's not enough, whereas Nerval will actually give us the experience of disorientation um, and confusion that we get in real travel. Uh, so um, in order to take us on the voyage, he has to take us on the voyage through all the difficulties of his language. Getting there too quickly would mean we didn't get there at all. Thank you. Sorry about the rest. Merci, Jenny. Um, I'll ask in English. Um, I had a question about um, the male protagonist's stance towards um, the travel of their lovers. So swan towards Al uh, towards Odette and um, Marcel towards Albertine um, in particular because I think the thing that separates the two dreams of swan is that Odette goes off um, with the Verdurins um, on a cruise and um, obviously it's incredibly painful for swan to imagine what she might be getting up to and then finally there's this uh, slightly awkward moment where he bumps into Cotard's wife on a on the bus, bus. Mm -hmm. and she says, oh, but uh, Odette's been saying how much she missed you, she missed you terribly. And in that, uh, in that moment, it's quite hard to know whether she's um, saying what he wants to hear or whether that's actually the case. So yeah, I suppose it's a question about anti-travel mm -hmm. narratives mm -hmm. of others. I think there's a, a contrast between um, uh, Odette's part, the going on this croisière, which is a kind of liberating moment. Actually, initially, it's liberating for Swan as well, because he doesn't feel this anguish as he expected to. And um, Albertine, because she wanted to go traveling, and she gives up on her cruise and stays within the 20 paces of the corridor. So it's a, she almost becomes Leonie. Uh, so she is la prisonnière, and it's the not going on the cruise that Odette does go on that makes her very much um, la prisonnière. So I think there is a sort of toing and froing between the, the male um, protagonist and the female. But the distance of Odette's travel liberates Swan almost as much as it liberates her. There's also an interesting question of whether um, this writing of travel narrative that I've talked about should be seen as just another version of writing about love. I think one argument could be, you know, well, is this just not another version of, of experiencing the reality of love? I think there's an important difference, which is that jealousy uh, plays a role in the experiencing the reality of the other person, whereas you don't get jealousy as a role in experiencing the reality of travel. It's a sort of more detached way of looking at um, the experience of the real. Um, 
I may have misheard you, but I think you quoted Bach as saying that thinking about places one hasn't been to is reminiscence, and you said it's not reminiscence, it's imagination. Mm. But if you ask me to think about a place I haven't been to, like Moscow, for example, I think about all the pictures I've seen of Moscow, and then I think about St. Petersburg, which I have been to, and I produce some kind of collage. But all of that imagination is some kind of reminiscence, even if it is secondhand. So maybe Bach's not too far <laughs> away from the truth. Thanks for this defense of Bach. Um, I think my, where I diverged from him was specifically in relation to the three phases that I was trying to look at. And the first phase is this source-tagged phase of illusion, which corresponds very well to sort of imagining Moscow um, with these sort of postcard images that one has. So it's not memory, but a source that one's taking from elsewhere and using uh, to construct something. At least that's how I was reading the phase but of illusion. I'm remembering looking at it. It's a well, we remember. Story, but a mm, one. Mm. Well, we remember. We do remember the source tagging. So, in a sense, he's remembering what Le Grandin or Swan have said about a place. Um, but the third phase of memory, at least in what I was trying to argue, is that it is a, a transformative phase. So, it's a phase that uh, is is much more positive. It's giving us um, a transformation of of the real. So, in that sense, it's more positive than the first phase, which is reductive and almost being framed in an ironic sort of way, as one does with a pastiche, or as Flaubert does when he has those citations sans guillemets, which is also Barthes' term. It's a, it's a much more, um, it's a containing gesture, whereas the third phase of memory is an opening out. So, but we won't throw Barthes out the window just yet. Je me demandais si, um, si, si le schéma que vous décrivez pouvait s'appliquer à d'autres types d'expériences. Je pense par exemple à une chose que je crois l'enfant le, Marcel désirait autant que voir les Carpaccio à Venise, c'était voir la Bermade en Phèdre. Et je crois me souvenir oui. que c'était une des grandes déceptions aussi de cet enfant-là. Oui. oui, tout à fait. Je crois que le, les, les phases d'illusion, désillusion et de transcendance ou revisiter le réel après s'applique à beaucoup de phénomènes, le, le phénomène de l'amour, entre autres, mais la Berma, bien sûr. Right? I was actually really struck when you, st when you spoke about the idea of imagination and what you said in, in relation to Proust, because something really struck me is that you could maybe apply rather similar terms to um, Céline, you know, the whole beginning of uh, uh, Un voyage au bout de la nuit, notre voyage à nous est entièrement imaginaire, voilà sa force, tout est inventé. Mm -hmm. Mm. And since the parallel between Proust and Céline is one of the very mm. famous and you know obvious ones in the French uh, early, early 20th century literature, I would be really interested to see whether how you could parallel them, maybe uh, see whether they are similar or actually common using that thread of, of the voyage. Mm. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. I must admit that ages since I've read A Voyage au bout de la nuit, but I'd really like to look at that again. This is part of a project that I, um, it's actually the project after the one after next, so I can't say that I'm <laughs> working on it quite in as much detail as I'd like to at the moment. Um, but I'm, what I'm interested in is the relationship between travel writing, um, the genre of travel writing and literary works and how um, they sort of interrelate with each other. And uh, while my 19th century hadn't quite got to Céline, I could extend it <laughs> to, to include that. So I, I was going to, uh, my hope is to look at um, how uh, 19th century, early 20th century literature respond to travel narratives and incorporate parts of it. So it's a very interesting idea, I think, that one that I'd like to pursue, certainly. Uh, Adam? Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question, it's perhaps more of a comment, but it, I was fascinated by what you said about the, the process of journeying, and it, it made me think about what else, what else those activities are doing in the novel, and it seems to me that there's, th there's a lot to be said about the social commentary that becomes possible when, people, when you go on a journey. Mm -hmm. um, and in Proust, that's often tied up with Eros, and so the, the, the girl who might bring him coffee when he's on the train Mm -hmm. um, the people that he sees and the, 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 the woman who sits and reads the Revue du, des Deux Mondes. Um, mm. the, it's, as always with Proust, it's, it, it's a lot more about, it's, a, it's about a lot more than just the journey. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity mm. for observation too. Um, and that sort of social observation and commentary, <laughs> as well as being part of an interest mm. in Eros, is also to do with uh, art and aesthetics, because the the social observation of the 
uh, I can't remember it, uh, what she sells, a glass seller, I think, in Milk. Venice, oh, the um, becomes an object of desire, and he tries to find her again, and he can't. Mm. Um, so no, it wasn't a question, was it? But <laughs> I suppose it's additional layers um, to, to, to what you're exploring. That one of the, um, well, thank you, that's very useful again. Uh, one of the motifs that I like and in, in would like to pursue is um, the quest for the woman in the city. This comes up in, in Flaubert, but I think very much in the Venice uh, parts that you're referring to, uh, where there's a sort of illusory quest for this fleeing object of desire uh, through the streets of a, of a city. Um, so I'm not sure whether that's a version of an anti-travel narrative. It is because you don't ever find this woman that you're, or, or the ideal woman that you're looking for. So you don't ever get to the end of what it was you were looking for. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a motif that comes up again throughout the 19th century and, and beyond. So again, that's a non-answer to your non-question, but <laughs> thank you.